born equal and endowed with certain unalienable rights. This is the natural condition of humanity according to the Declaration of Independence, a document that offers the world a vision of a free society and with it a vision of free and equal individuals whose rights are guaranteed by our political institutions. The idea of natural equality was novel, to say the least, as was the idea of a political order founded upon equal rights. So much so that the authors of the Federalist Papers referred to it as a great experiment for mankind. But as with any experiment, success was by no means certain. The founders were well aware of the daunting challenges confronting them as they labored to establish a system of self-government in a world dominated by monarchical and aristocratic regimes. In the 18th century, one was born into his place, and there too often he remained. Social mobility was a concept almost entirely foreign to a world of hierarchy, rank, and inherited privilege. From the vantage point of many of its contemporaries, the egalitarianism of the Declaration appeared as something radical and radically new. The notion of the equality of individuals was contested then, and it remains in some sense contested even now. So what did the founders mean by equality? Did they understand it differently than we do? And who among history's great political thinkers influenced those who authored the Declaration? And how might the founders shed light on our own concerns with equality today? We put these and other questions to four of the nation's leading scholars of American political thought. Here's what they had to say. I think there's a short answer to what the Declaration meant by equality, and there's a professor's answer. Let me give you the, the short answer. Men are equal, and by men, I think it's important to say all persons. Men are equal in the rights to which they are endowed, inalienable rights such as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In that sense, all people are equal. And then I would say uh, that uh, this suggests that there's no natural hierarchy uh, of who should rule and be ruled. For example, uh, there's no such thing as the divine right of king by which someone is ordained to rule, or a caste of priests, or a master race that uh, should rule, and therefore, uh, obviously, no slavery. For the founders, equality meant in the first instance um, that no person is born subjected to the authority of somebody else. That is, that there's no natural claim to authority that one person has over another. That's, that was the first or primary meaning as in the Declaration of Independence. Behind that, affirmation of equal political authority, if you will, lay the idea that human beings are equal rights possessors, that they possess rights, that they have equal rights, and that they are equal rights possessors. One of the implications of those two claims was that people should be equal under the law. And one of the implications of being equal under the law is that people would have equal opportunity to pursue a form of life, a way of life, a series of pursuits in life that would please them, so long as they are socially responsible about the way they do it. So in thinking about equality, very often they're thinking about the conventional character of inequality. It doesn't have to be a world that because you were born poor or a serf or into some trade, that you and your children's children are all condemned to live in that same way. If you look at human beings, biologically, so to speak, there are no clear marks, physically, that says, this is superior. This is someone who's born to rule. Or look at this other fellow, and you could say, well, he's born to be ruled. Jefferson has a, a fine line, which he took from somebody else. You know, have some men been born with saddles on their back, and others booted and spurred to ride them? No. So to that extent, there's a natural equality. And if there's going to be an inequality asserted and formed as a part of a body politic, there ought to be some good reasons to support that. It's not self-evident that you were born to be a ruler and I was born to be your servant. In the Declaration of Independence, the notion of equality refers to a conception of human dignity. Human beings, by nature, 
have no authority over others, what others can do with their lives. They cannot dictate to others. Such authority rests upon the consent of the governed. So, to put it in more concrete terms, self-evident that you're equal means that you're not another person's slave. How many people who are enslaved willingly accept that condition? It's true that uh, this idea could be beaten into you. You could be denied the right to read. You could be preached for your whole life to, that uh, you were a slave. And evidently, this has had effect on people. But over the course of history, how many people really have consented to be a slave? How many times have we seen uh, rebellions of those who were in slavery? So in this sense, when you look at it directly and clearly, I think it is self-evident. It's a description, I think, in the Declaration's view of how men actually are. Uh, uh, and this is why it's self-evident. It's based on a fact, not on a wish. Human beings, when you analyze them at their core, um, uh, want to be free and equal. So human beings are not so different that one could claim, by nature, a right to rule another. Where did this notion come from? And what was the role played by John Locke, the philosopher most often credited with influencing the thinking of the founders? That generation of founders, of the people we usually think of as founders, were great readers. They owed a lot to the philosophic tradition of Britain and France, and they read them. So they knew firsthand, that's say through their own direct reading, not through uh, uh, hearsay or uh, Wikipedia summaries, what people like James Harrington, Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, they knew their doctrines. They knew what political principles and considerations they were trying to raise. There's no work that was more influential on the conception and writing of the Declaration of Independence than Locke's two treatises of government. Toward the beginning of the second treatise, Locke introduces this notion of a state of perfect liberty, which human beings have in a state of nature, that is, human beings have by nature, and a state of equality, which human beings are in also by nature. He begins with liberty. He's quickly led to equality. And he doesn't, through the course of his earlier discussion in the two treatises, distinguish so very clearly between these two notions. And it's an important question in understanding Locke why. And here's the fundamental reason that our fundamental equality for Locke lies in the fact that we are free. And our fundamental freedom is equal among all human beings in a state of nature. I think the most important thing is that Locke gave uh, the basis for the idea that people are free and equal, and that government is based upon rights. This was the experiment that uh, was suggested uh, by the founders to try and establish such a, a government. And uh, uh, the, the method that's laid out by, by Jefferson is the idea of recognizing people's equality and their rights, compacting in some ways so that these rights are recognized in society. Then human beings will be basically satisfied. I would say that uh, the founders' understanding of equality is exactly Locke's understanding of equality. He was completely influential on the founders on their understanding of equality. Um, Locke understood equality in, as being, as he states in, the, in his second treatise of government, as equality in jurisdiction among human beings in what he calls the state of nature. That is, in a situation before human beings are subjected to legitimate political authority. His point, Locke's point in that, is to state a beginning point for thinking about how legitimate authority comes to exist. And um, that's exactly how the founders use it in the Declaration, setting out a beginning point from which we then move via consent to the creation of legitimate government for the sake of securing rights, exactly the same point that, uh, that Locke made. When you got out to America, uh, to our Wild West, say, the Connecticut River Valley, <laughs> which is practically at the frontier then, there are people who thought very much in Lockean terms. We can make a fresh beginning. We don't have that old order. We set up our own little world here where we have a voice, where we're heard, we're seen, and we live with the consequences of our choices, be they good or bad. That was an enormously liberating experience. This is new stuff. Who would have thought it? Well, you could say, in a way, 
Locke thought it. And this is one of the consequences of his way of thinking about politics. Locke's philosophy pointed to a political arrangement based on equality. But he lived in a world of aristocratic hierarchy, a world of inherited status and little social mobility. What are the differences between the old aristocratic order and the new democratic society Locke's philosophy pointed to? And what did Alexis de Tocqueville, widely viewed as one of the keenest observers of the transition from aristocracy to democracy, make of the new democratic order he found in America? An aristocratic order is set and stable. Those who rule are on the top, their positions are known, the others follow. So in this sense, the followers uh, have a job to do, and that's to, to listen, not to initiate. Once the idea of aristocracy is eliminated, and uh, you said many now achieve the same status all, uh, all together at this level, and a tremendous amount of initiative is uh, unleashed, particularly in the commercial realm. People want to better themselves. They take the initiative themselves. They don't follow merely the dictates of what the aristocrats have told them to do. Feudal institutions made divisions among human beings. Human beings were thrown into classes, thrown into castes. The notion of an aristocracy requires a lower order. This never existed in the United States. Tocqueville understood that the people who came to America were quite different. And one of the things that led him to recognize this was his name. We call him Tocqueville, but that was the name of the estate. He was Alexei de Tocqueville. He was Alexei of this estate, the Tocqueville estate. That wasn't his last name. His last name was Crerel. He realized that in America, there weren't estates. Social mobility and an aristocratic order are almost contradictions in terms. That is, an aristocratic order is an order in which persons' social positions, they're more or less born into them and there are limitations on what they can do to move out of them. Democratic societies are societies in which it's very difficult to merely maintain your status by virtue of being born into it. it it's something that you have to uh, uh, act to, to uh, maintain on your own. So. There's a kind of, it's not merely social mobility, it's mobility of resources, economic resources, as people are free to buy and sell as they have the resources to do. Geographic mobility, as people are free to move to where they have more opportunity. Um, as they are free from legal encumbrances of one kind or another to remain where they are both socially and uh, physically. My first teacher of Tocqueville was my mother who not only had never read Tocqueville, I'm certain she never knew his name. I was 11 years old, we're waiting at a bus stop where I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. And as often happened, there was a very long line of people waiting to board the bus. People in front of us started going and all of a sudden there was this man, very well dressed, wearing a suit and a tie, who was in a rush and pushed his way on. And my mother, she didn't raise her voice very much. She raised her voice at this point and said, who the hell do you think you are? That, in a nutshell, is Tocqueville. The notion of who you are, of thinking that you're superior, for Tocqueville, this is an aristocratic notion. The notion of democracy, of democratic man, of a new democratic order, is a notion that all human beings are fundamentally equal. Tocqueville saw that egalitarian societies, when they are free, are likely to uh, produce human initiative, human activity, human creativity, and innovation. Aristocratic societies, on the other hand, are not likely to produce such results because aristocratic societies contain within them all pre-existing limitations on what human beings can do and what they can accomplish. And while Tocqueville was appreciative of many of the good things that aristocratic societies could produce, he also saw that this kind of liberation of the human faculty, of the human person to achieve uh, things was not one of, those, one of those goals. Tocqueville had this extraordinary capacity to take the slightest of examples and to flesh them out to some important point. 
One such example he articulates in one of his journals. He's walking in Boston with his guide, and he sees a man on a porch pouring lemonade for people who just happen to be walking past. Shirt sleeves rolled up, shaking their hands. So Phil is astonished by this. What exactly is going on here? This man who owns a fairly nice house, people just walking up. Who is this man? He asks this question to his guide. This guy says, oh, he's a federal court judge. Tocqueville stops walking, turns his head back, and looks at this man once again. This man would have been an aristocrat, would have been above commoners in France. This meant a great deal for Tocqueville as he tried to think through as carefully as he could this new democratic order that he thought was exhibited in America and the older aristocratic order that was France. We've seen how equality and modern democracy represented a powerful break with the old aristocratic order. But how has the idea of equality changed since the writing of the Declaration? The idea of uh, equality in the Declaration had a primarily political significance. It was uh, what equality meant for the formation of government and for the ends and objectives of government. After the Declaration and after the period of the founding, you could say this idea of equality began to take on other meanings, added meanings that people imputed to it. Maybe meanings that were implicit in it, but not explicit. This is explicitly recognized in other philosophies of, of governance that have ideas of equality, ideas that have a different source than the, the Declaration. So in the view of many today, the true idea of equality would be something like equal uh, results that everyone should end up with uh, the same or much of the same, and that it should be the objective of government to uh, uh, assure that this is the case. Now, one could debate whether this idea is a good idea or a bad idea. It's not the, the idea that, that derives from the Declaration. Thus, if you want to put it simply, we speak of the idea of equality. But the idea of equality, as, as is used today, has many different sources, some compatible with the Declaration, some incompatible with the Declaration. So equality for the founding generation had this conjury of meanings, equal in original political authority, equal as consenters to the government, equal as rights holders, equal in their claim to opportunity, equal in the, the way the law applies to them. Those are, I think, uh, the range of things that the founding generation understood by equality. They did not understand by equality some of the things that we now tend to think of. So when we talk about equality or inequality in society, we tend to think of things like income inequality or uh, inequality of possessions of various kinds, material inequalities. They tended not to think of that. They saw inequality of uh, income, inequality of material possessions to be a result of equality of opportunity and liberty. The founders' conception of equality was it's a matter of nature. The human beings have equal dignity. Now the notion of equality as a political notion is circumscribed to a matter of wealth and the question of the distribution of resources. What the founders would be interested in, what the Declaration of Independence was interested in, was not a question of economic equality, but of political equality. Because if you are equal under the rule of law, and you work hard, you pay attention, you have the capacity to use opportunities, the capacity to improve your own circumstance. This, of course, doesn't mean that everyone will. This doesn't mean that everyone's effort will guarantee a higher stake in the world, a higher position in life. Fortune rears its ugly head, and we all know about fortune. I think part of our problem with equality today is that in saying, as the Declaration is often understood to be saying, equality of opportunity, but no guarantee of equal outcomes, a fair start in a race, but you're not all going to get the gold medal. That politically is an awkward proposition for people, for many people to accept today. However, what commerce makes possible is the opportunity to raise one's circumstance. And if one is lower than someone, 
one is still equal politically. If one has less money than others, one is still equal when it comes to human dignity. The problem in our own time is that we take an equal distribution of resources to be the mark of human dignity. As if if you have fewer economic resources, somehow, of course, you're less off when it comes to human dignity. But the Declaration of Independence, the founders did not think that was true. Equality, human dignity is a matter of nature. And if one recognizes that, there's a matter of self-respect that comes from it, independent of one's economic circumstances in the world. Believe me, I know. I grew up in a federal housing project. This sounds corny to say, but I once had to go to school with sneakers and get a special dispensation. This was a time in which one couldn't wear sneakers to school because we didn't have very much money. But I did have a mother who once said, who the hell do you think you are? And I realized there not only what Tocqueville represented, but what it meant to be equal when it comes to self-respect, human dignity, and an overall sense of self-worth. We've only scratched the surface in our exploration of the history and meaning of equality. If you're interested in learning more, go to jackmillercenter.org and click on the online resource center. Thanks for watching.